State lawmakers went into this year's legislative session with high hopes. There were bills regarding prison reform, loosening marijuana laws, raising the minimum wage, plastic waste, disaster relief, more money for schools, and resolving water rights issues across the state. What were the successes? What were the failures? What should have been talked about? Join us as we wrap up the 2019 legislative session. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Daryl Huff. The legislature sent 298 bills to the governor this year. That's less than 10% of the bills that were introduced back in January. They include voting by mail, money for new preschools, taxing vacation rentals, legal or not, and decriminalizing marijuana possession. Our guests tonight include a Democrat from the state Senate, a Republican from the state house, an online columnist and member of a government watchdog group. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Senator Rosalind Baker chairs the Commerce, Consumer Protection, and Health Committee. She is a Democrat representing Senate District 6, which covers South and West Maui. Representative Bob McDermott is the House Assistant Minority Leader. He represents District 40, which covers Eva Beach and parts of the Eva Plain. Douglas Meller represents the Hawaii League of Women Voters. And Chad Blair is the opinion and politics editor for Honolulu Civil Beat, an online news service. Chad, you were down there quite a bit this year. How would you characterize this session? You're not going to ask me to give it a grade or something like that? No, I don't do that. Well, it was surprising. It was fairly quiet, I think, for much of the session. And things really got crazy, particularly in the state senate the last couple of weeks. Um, the session started with everybody, the governor, the leadership in the House and the Senate, agreeing that this is it. Minimum wage is going to go up. We raised it last, last year, $10.10 an hour. And there were proposals to raise it to 12 or to 15 or to 17. And of course, that died in conference committee, which I think took a lot of people by surprise. There was also talk about marijuana. Recreational marijuana gets introduced all the time, never goes anywhere. And it didn't make it this year, but to my surprise, a decriminalization bill, three grams or less, a fine of $130, and I think there's a provision to expunge the record of people as well, basically to keep nonviolent folks uh, out of jail for possessing marijuana. And that is going to the governor's desk to see what he does. So I was kind of surprised. You, you go in, there's always going to be surprises, but I never expected minimum wage not to make it. But otherwise, it was more substantial than you thought. Certainly in the last two weeks, particularly in the Senate regarding the, uh, the Airbnb bill, as we called it, taxing short-term vacation rentals. I'm sure the senator can speak more about that because she was behind closed doors. And then the water rights bill, uh, that one also was highly contentious. It did not make it out of the session, and we'll have to see what happens. But some of the stuff that happened in the Senate floor and in, in committee was really surprising. A 12-12 vote on a Friday night in conference. I had never seen that before. You know, we'll um, go over some of the really specific things. Sure. I'm, sure we're gonna, I'm hoping their viewers will participate by giving us a lot of specific questions about issues. I'm, I'm curious, Douglas Meller from League of Women Voters, as a representative of an organization that gauges public interest and engagement, tries to encourage engagement in these processes, did you feel like the public was engaged with this legislature? Do you feel like there's enough voice of the public down there? The legislative website and the legislature's system for allowing public testimony is truly amazing. Anybody with a computer has the ability to submit written testimony to any legislative committee, to read every conference committee report, to read every committee report, to read everybody else's written testimony. And I'm hopeful that in months, years to come, I guess it'll be, the legislature will actually allow the public to go online and vid play videos showing what the oral testimony was in any specific bill. So you don't have to sit through the entire legislative hearing in order to figure out what was said, what questions were asked, why they did, did the committee decide to kill bills. Um, if a committee killed a bill, short of watching the hearing testimony and watching the decision making real time on a video, you have no way of finding out. Which it's interesting you bring up the, the online aspect of it. I know it's changed the way we cover the legislature because it's so much easier to track things. But we'll talk a little bit later about how it might have changed the climate down at the Capitol. But Bob Dermott is a Republican and a Republican fin 
minority over there. How, how was it for you folks? Did you feel like you were adequately able to get your message out and to participate? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't think it was a controversial session, particularly in the House. Uh, with only five of us, we're not a threat in any way. And so then I would go to all politics is local, right? So for personally, Forever Beach, we got uh, 6.29 million for a new athletic facility. And as Republicans, we really- At Campbell High School. Yeah, at Campbell High School, largest high school in the state. So as Republicans, we really have to focus on our district. Uh, we're not gonna have much say in the policy statewide. Uh, with only five of us. So it's really all politics is local. So we kind of just hone in on our neighborhood and do the best we can. Um, Senator Baker, you're the, the real veteran among us here. How, how, <laughs> how was it this year uh, compared to, say, other years that you've been in the Senate? Well, every beginning of the biennium is always a little bit more contentious, a lot more bills to weed through. Uh, my committee heard a third of the bills that actually were introduced into the legislature. So uh, we had... Uh, but we had great participation. You know, we, we had a lot of very meaty issues uh, and they moved forward. So I thought it was a pretty good session. You know, I always have a little bit like uh, Bob, the, uh, the local, you know, what were the nonprofits that got funded in my district? What, what schools got uh, CIP money? What, uh, what were some of the other things that were of particular concern to Maui County? Um, you know, uh, Chad mentioned the minimum wage not passing. Was that personally a surprise to you? Or what, what happened with the minimum wage? What, oh, let me add to that question. Is that it struck me that it was odd that at some point in the process, it, uh, the health care issue was attached to it. Did that put too much of a burden on that? On that? I think probably if you're looking at it from a small business perspective, because I think what p folks were saying is if you're raising the minimum wage, and of course we have, uh, if you work over 20 hours, the employer needs to pay for your health care, then that just adds to sort of a pyramiding effect that some people believe as a result. And I think we were not able to fully explain how that could have been mitigated and that it was really good for the health of the community, for the health of kids, to have more money and to be able to really not have to depend so much on government services for different things in our community. So it was like you were disappointed that it didn't pass. Yeah, I was disappointed it didn't pass. Chad, what was your observation about the dynamic there? What, what happened to that bill? Well, there were two main bills. Uh, one of them made it to conference, the other didn't. I think Brian Taniguchi and Aaron Johansson, the respective labor chairs, were really trying to craft a compromise that worked. But something that came late that really jinxed the whole thing was the, the Labor Department bringing up the prepaid health care, and the senator is absolutely right, it is a burden to have to provide health care. This is already a high tax state in so many ways for small businesses. And so the idea was maybe we can somehow help them out. Maybe their wage will go to $13 an hour because they're covering health care. Maybe it'll be 15 for others. But then there was also talk of a $17 an hour wage for state workers. And well, the, the Labor Department that... eventually said, you can't do this. You're going to start messing with this very fundamental law passed in the 1970s, and it's just too messy. There was even a tax credit proposal. Um, anybody can weigh in on this from what they observed. Uh, Bob McDermott, you said you were actually were, were prepared to vote yeah. for a minimum wage. In fact, I introduced a bill that raised it, but I had a trading wage in there for 14 to 18 year olds. Because my fear is we're going to hit a tipping point where all the fast food places like McDonald's and Burger King are going to go to these kiosks. You already, you already see it, them up in, oh, I see them in Wahiwa, Eva Beach. And the Eva Beach McDonald's is probably has 20 kids at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, right? It's going to get to a point where we're going to raise it and the people will have to go to the kiosks. But one of the interesting thing about the kiosks, I was in Wahiwa last weekend, and a couple of young people came in and they had the option, either go to the counter or go to the kiosk. And the young folks with the computer stuff, they preferred the kiosk. Oh, I mean, people are going to prefer to order by their phone while they're walking to the restaurant. That's, right. Those kiosks are going to be obsolete by next week. Right. So my concern was the, the tipping point at which we put young people out of work. And then the other thing is, I don't think we fully grappled with the tip credit as a, with people working at Ruth's Chris as opposed to the Highway Inn. How do you how do you balance that? I mean, Doug Miller, you know, you've watched the legislative process quite a bit over the years, too. I mean, what is your read on what happened to minimum wage, even if you, you weren't fully engaged in the issue itself and not speaking for the League of Women Voters, what was the dynamic, the late people coming in, the late information, what do you think might have sunk it? 
my experience is that when there are too many loose issues at play, it's hard to compromise them at the last minute. You sort of have to work things through and come up with something there's a consensus on before the session begins, before you can get a bill through most of the time. That's why bills usually take two or three years to get through, even when most people agree. I think that's what surprises people. You, you have a clear agreement. Everybody's talking about it on the first day of the session. And then four months later, oops. It seems like an oops. Uh, as I want to just mention that the first question we got was about minimum wage. Good job. Um, anybody else want to throw anything else about minimum wage? I mean, I could it have throw, been salvaged at the end, do you think? Go ahead. I'll throw out one thing. There are other places that regulate minimum wages, and they don't have one minimum wage which applies to all professions. They regulate by the profession. That's a way of totally avoiding a debate about how much tips are versus when you're talking about people who are making beds in a hotel. What do you, what do you think, Senator? Do you think that there is a, a mechanism that might replace the idea of having to come into the legislature every time you raise a minimum wage, which is essentially government telling business what they have to do? Well, I think if we can come to an agreement that there ought to be a base level of uh, effort and income for people in order to be able to live in Hawaii, that if we can come up with some of those basic understandings and roll it all in, then I think it might be easier. So but, you know, we have, we have folks that are under contract. Their, their wages are collectively bargained. And those are pretty much taken care of. It's the ones that are not in that situation that I think have a difficult time because it's either one-on-one -on -one with your employer or maybe there's two or three people. And if you're not looking out at, you know, we have so little unemployment, you would think that employers would really want to be out there recruiting and one of the best ways to recruit is to right, increase right. The, the wage. You know, Roz brought up a good point that was hidden in one of her comments earlier. The minimum wage, say it's a single adult on their own, uh, at, at, this, at the level it's at now, she, she mentioned they have to uh, depend on services. So they're going to get food stamps and everything else to lift them up to that $45,000 or whatever it is level, yeah. level, right? So. I mean, do we want government to mandate it? If government doesn't, we're picking it up on the back end anyway. And is it a living wage or a minimum wage? I mean, that's still a discussion. Is it an entry-level training wage, or is it a wage for people to live on? Was there a um, was there sort of a a lesson to be learned from the skill of the Chamber of Commerce and the business community and the way they lobbied on this? Because There's no they, doubt. they looked like they were doomed <laughs> at the beginning of the year. They sure did, and they've been back and forth with the leads. They've seen the the, the rate increase incrementally, you try and control it so it doesn't hurt a, a business overwhelmingly in one year. But I think Sherry uh, McNor, Menor, McNamara, uh, excuse me, I pronounced Sherry's name wrong, sorry Sherry, uh, was su generally surprised that they were successful. Remember this bill died literally in the last few hours of the final day of conference committee. I think trying to negotiate a big change, like let's take this bill and put it back into that bill, should have been handled before they got to conference committee. Okay, um, from the uh, an anonymous caller, would the senator and representative comment on legalizing marijuana? What are their views? I'll start with you, Bob McDermott. Where you, how do you feel about what passed? Well, I'm a church man, Daryl. So I, I'm going to say, that use marijuana, <laughs> so, I, <you> know. <laughs> so I'll say uh, no. Now, as a as a young man, I, I tried it uh, probably 10, 12 times. Uh, I don't see the, the the value in it. And here here's where, where Lee Cataluna pointed out, we're kind of schizophrenic. On one hand, we're trying to tell kids, don't vape, don't use flavored vape, don't smoke. And then eventually, within the decade, it'll be legalized. We're, we're, we're going to legalize another smoking product. So I don't, I don't get it. But uh, I don't think it adds any value to the society at large. But I'm not a, I mean, I'm not a prude on the subject, but it just, I just wouldn't support it. Senator Baker, what happened with that issue? Well, I'm very much in favor of med our medical cannabis bill, uh, law and program. And I really think that we need to focus on that and make sure that we have all of the kinks out of that program and have the benefits uh, that cannabis can provide to a lot of folks with some very debilitating um, diseases. And so that was my focus rather than uh, legalization or decrim. You know, I'm a child of the 60s. Uh, <laughs> I understand. Uh, that people, you know, want to use it recreationally. I think we made a, a good step by decriminalization. 
but I'm not ready to go for just recreation. I really am more concerned about our medical cannabis program. You know, Senator Rhodes at one point, sort of out of the blue, came up with a proposal that would have the dispensaries also be the sales point for the recreational yes. marijuana. And that had sort of an elegance to it. What happened with that idea? Was it, was it just too much, too quickly? And what, what, what happened with well, that? You know, we may be a very blue state, but we can be very conservative on some things. And I think that was just too much of a, a, a stretch for this particular point in time. But I think, you know, it's going to be an issue that's going to come up again. And we'll keep looking and looking to other states and seeing how everybody else is handling it and maybe advised in, in a different way. Daryl, I would just add that there's no guarantee that Governor Ige is going to sign the decrim bill into law. We asked him about it after the session ended, and he has said what he's always said. It's illegal at the federal level. He has grave concerns about that. The biggest argument for decrim, I think, is keeping people out of jail that shouldn't be there. But there's another argument as well, and the senator alluded to it. Money, uh, the revenue that is coming into states like Colorado and Washington is very, very tempting. When we look at an Airbnb bill, trying to get revenue from that or taxing mm -hmm. real estate investment trust funds, I think it's only a matter of time before not just decrim, should it be killed by the governor, but legalization comes uh, to the state of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts on that one, Douglas? League of Women Voters stayed out of this whole <laughs> issue, but I have a personal observation, which is the law is a piece of paper. If a significant number of people don't comply, the law just goes away. That's what happened to a prohibition. And speaking of Airbnb, <laughs> <laughs> now the reason I mentioned that is because that Airbnb was an interesting concept. It was, we're going to tax um, these places whether they're legal or not. And how did you feel about that? How did that go down in, for, for in the Senate? Well, I know you guys were forced at the end to take a vote on it, it felt like. Well, you know, if you have an activity, the zoning laws are the county's prerogative. The city and county of Honolulu testified before the Senate uh, a couple of years ago that they know where all, the, all of the Airbnbs are uh, on this island, that they know how many people are staying there, what the rates are, they know all of that. Well, if they do, then they should be enforcing in areas that really don't want them. Uh, but I think if they're going to be operating, they should be paying the transient accommodations tax, they should be paying the general excise tax, and that's only fair. So I think um, we had put some standards in the Senate version. That's not what passed, but I think it's a good step forward because it's going to put everybody on notice that you, if you're running a business, and that's what an Airbnb is, it's a business, and some people need that business to be able to pay their mortgage. I don't have a problem with that. I represent a resort area, so it doesn't, it doesn't trouble me the way it does some of my friends in some other parts of uh, our state but they ought to be paying their taxes. And I think it, it goes back to the counties to pick up the enforcement. Were, were you folks in support yeah, of that bill, the Republicans? Yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, I, I think if we didn't pass it, the city council would not have a, any sense of urgency to deal with this. They haven't shown it the last decade. They just keep kicking the can down the road. And just the other day, they, they failed to pass it. Kicked it again. Right. So now they have to get off their duff. I think the last license of Airbnb was 1990 that was given by the city and county. So it's not just the Airbnbs, it's the, the transit rooms and all that, every, everything. The bed and breakfast, all of those. Yeah. All that stuff. And it is changing the landscape of our community, so we have to deal with it. I think Senator Favela makes the point that it's even changing things in Eva Beach. Yes, a little bit down by the water, yeah. You know, here's another bill. I'm not sure that the governor is gonna sign this. There was another Airbnb bill, I think just two years, two ago. years ago. He yeah. vetoed it, they're not identical, but the concern that Laura Thielen, who represents a district with a lot of these mm -hmm. units, same with Gil Riviera up on the North Shore, it was in fact many of the senators from those areas where they're, they're in many ways infested with these units. Uh, there's concern about whether you basically you are taking money from an illegal business, and there was no cracking down on the illegality. You were basically saying it's okay because now Airbnb and HomeAway are going to collect the revenue for us, act as a broker, and give us money. Isn't there in that bill, though, a provision that says that they do have to tell the state tax department yes. who they're collecting? And yes. does that get into the enforcement part? It could easily get into the enforcement part. There was language in the Senate version that had even tougher language. But 
There is also language in the bill that's sitting on the governor's desk that says nothing in this bill shall prohibit any uh, county from enforcing their own zoning laws and ordinances. Is it something where incrementally you next year, for example, could say, and the tax department will share at the very least the addresses of these? We almost always come back. I, I rarely see a perfect bill get passed by the legislature and signed by the governor. So I would not be surprised because I think um, there are many communities that are negatively impacted and they don't like it and it's going to be incumbent upon the council and if we have to provide them with a little bit more specifics as the original senate version had then i think that's probably something i would also do. say the counties <laughs> are in fact after a long time finally moving on this you're seeing yeah. that in hawaii county and in maui county yes. for sure you got things on the books and the honolulu city council came close just yesterday, there are still bills alive, 85 and 89. They're going to have to go back and be worked on again. But I think it is reaching a critical point right now, and something will be done. Uh, Doug Diller, would you, th this one actually created quite a bit of animosity between the House and the Senate because the, I think the Senate felt like the House was playing big body and not going to pass anything but our bill. What did you think of that particular process from a public participation standpoint? And also, was... Did you see the, the kind of tactics this year about changing bills at the last minute so that, that you folks have complained about and even sued over before, gotten replaced and stuff like that? Did you see a lot of that this year? There is as <clears throat> much of that this year as in previous years. Usually when we put something out there to the news media, we're talking about the bills that actually passed the legislature. So out of the dozens and dozens where it happens, only a handful actually make it through and come out of conference committee. We haven't done our evaluation yet as to which, which made it through. But there were some pretty flagrant examples this year which made it to conference. We just don't know if they came through yet. Okay, um, I got a bunch of callers now. A, a number of callers around the issue of the public safety um, appointment of uh, Nolan Espinda. Nolan Espinda. Espinda. And uh, it, that ended up being a surprisingly hot issue considering all the stuff that happened, including <laughs> the riot in Maui. Yes. Um, and uh, so one caller says, a uh, uh, caller is constituent of and disappointed with Senator Baker because she criticized the public safety director when the problem is the legislature underfunding public safety. That is not true. <laughs> I'll let you do this. I'll give you the other one, too. It says, um, what are your comments recover regarding the cover-up of, of the riot at the Maui prison? So let's just talk about this spin for a little bit, but go ahead. The, the legislature underfunding is what this caller is asking about. Is that more of a problem than the guy who's leading the department? Leadership of any department starts at the top with the director. And he has not been a very effective leader. When you have people sleeping on the job uh, in Maui County prisons, uh, when you have people that don't know where they're supposed to be, they taking too much vacation. You know, there was a lot of issues that came out, and unfortunately, some of the issues, particularly with Maui, had they come out before the Senate voted on Director Espenda, I don't think he would have gotten confirmed. Well, you mean like the 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 the, the double escape while the guards were asleep, yes. even though it was after the riot, yes. right? So things yes. didn't. Well, see, up. the the thing that a lot of people don't understand, <clears throat> and the major cause of the riot were all of these unadjud unadjudicated pretrial detainees. That's what the bulk of the prisoners are in Maui County, and so, you know, if they if the phones are broken. They can't have access uh, to mail. They can't have access to anybody outside. You know, things are just And they're not even convicted yet, And they're not right? convicted of anything. I mean, it's really unconscionable, I think, some of the conditions. And either the director has never made the appropriate case, or I know people maybe don't, aren't as interested in funding prisons as they are schools. But nevertheless, for a situation where we have so many people who have been accused of a crime but are there because they can't make bail or other reasons, it, look, it means that we need to take a holistic look at criminal justice reform, how we operate our prisons, what's needed there, and how we, how we staff them, and how we train them. And we're not providing that kind of training, and it goes right back to the director, as far as I'm concerned. Well, let me ask, so we've, th we've heard this before. We need a, a comprehensive look at our prison system, and, and, and they, there hasn't been any significant facilities added in, in years anywhere. So I know I hear you saying 
maybe it's because there's too many people in those facilities for reasons other than public safety. But what, what, what do you see as a legislative will to deal with these issues? There were some criminal justice reform measures that made it through the legislature. One in particular that surprised me, an oversight commission for the prisons and the jails. And I think that could really go a long way. It will be independent, essentially have oversight over uh, Director Espinda. By the way, it still surprises me that he didn't make it, he didn't get conf the votes in committee and yet it still went to the floor and he survived 17 to 8. There was also a measure regarding reforming of bail and Senator Baker mentioned that there's just too many people being in these facilities. Many of them cannot afford to post that bail and so they stay in jail and that's causing these overcrowding situations which leads to situations like the riot at the Maui jail. But I think those measures uh, could actually help. Did the legislature go far enough? I don't know. There were two task force that informed both those pieces of legislation, and I'm sure that they will be revisited again next session. But I was somewhat heartened to see that those bills got through, particularly the Oversight Commission. You know, Bob, when you talk about this kind of reform, a lot of times it makes Republicans stand up and go, wait a minute, we've got to think about public safety first before we release people into the community. Where do you stand well, on Well, the, the, the bills were nonviolent offenders, right? Yeah. right? So if someone was marijuana or something, they're not going to pose a threat to. They were all nonviolent. But when I go back to the jail situation, OCCC on Oahu is antiquated as you can get. The, the, in the visiting room, the furniture in the visiting room is, I think it's from 1978. The springs <laughs> go down. There's no springs. You spent a lot of time. <laughs> <laughs> no. We, we had a tour with Chad was talking sure. about with uh, Judge Wilson and uh, another retired judge who were instrumental in this. Wilson led the, one of the task force. Yeah, who were instrumental in and what, one of the good things about our jail is that we're not L.A. County Jail. We don't have gangbangers yeah. in there yeah. like the mainland where, you, you know, you, it, it, you, it's death, right? You know, um, it's much more calm like our island and most everybody's related. In Although the sheriffs, uh, they did shoot an inmate escaping from OCCC, a fatality. There was also a shooting by deputy sheriffs they got, at the Capitol as well. They're getting sued about that one now. Yes, too. they are. Okay, um, I've got, I'm starting to get a, uh, a traffic jam here of, of callers, <laughs> and so uh, we'll try and um, really touch on a lot of these things. A um, couple of callers saying, oh, how dare they give themselves a raise but not raise the minimum wage. Are you guys getting a lot of heat for that? Is that, I mean, the, the fact that the Salary Commission did approve a raise for legislators and there was just no review of it, it's just boom, done, slam dunk. I, I can honestly tell you, honestly, I didn't know about it through till halfway through the session, so I, I didn't. I had no idea. Well, why wouldn't Republicans of all people stand up and say, wait a minute, we should at least talk about this before we give ourselves a raise? Well, I think I can answer that question. First, that commission meets every seven years, and it's not just the legislature. They're also looking at the judicial branch and the executive as well. And second of all, the legislature only had one call in this to turn it down. They didn't actually get to vote on it or tell the commission, well, that's too much and so forth. It was a take it or leave it offering and it was very quiet and some are equating that with well, how come you didn't raise the minimum wage but it wasn't the decision of the legislature to raise their salaries. Um, it, Doug Miller, you know, as an as a observer of process, what do you think of that process? I mean, I think that the reason that they have a system like that is because at some point in the not too distant past, the legislature gave itself a raise at the 11th hour when no one was listening, looking, and so they established these salary commissions. They have them in the counties Correct. too. Uh, but you end up in this place where there's not a whole lot of discussion in the public about what's the appropriate pay scale. We're gonna have legislators making in the 70s in a, f in a few, few years. What do you think? My recollection, and it's kind of dim, is that the salary commissions with vetoes by the legislative body were set up because legislators were unwilling to take the political heat of paying themselves a reasonable wage. Mm. And it was recommended by the, you know, the, the Constitutional Convention and it's, if you let legislators decide their own salary, usually they don't take the heat of giving themselves a, a living wage for legislators. Uh, I'm hearing somebody in public going, oh, too bad, but I'm not going <laughs> to, <laughs> not me saying that. Okay, um, yeah, high cost of living. Oh, another, uh, on another appointment issue, um, Joby Masagatani actually didn't, did I say that right? Yes, you did, did. Actually didn't get appointed this year, the head of the Hawaiian Homelands. Bill Isla's uh, 
confirmation as a deputy went pretty well. Now he's turned around and hired her back at the department. Um, that's a department that's been under fire. I mean, how do we feel? How do you guys feel about what happened with that department in particular? Was that um, was there enough accountability by her being stepping away? I. That's not a department, unfortunately, that I've... That's not in your supervision? Yeah, so what, what, what I, I, haven't, I haven't looked at it that carefully. Well, uh, Governor Ige did want Jovi Mascatani to serve another term. He actually did announce at the beginning of session that she was going to be reappointed. He never did send down a governor's message to get a confirmation hearing because the word got out, particularly from the media, that she didn't, she didn't have the votes. And so he changed his mind on that. But the dissatisfaction I've heard over and over again about DHHL is the, the lack, the sluggish effort to get people on those lands that yes. they're entitled to. And that's been a problem decade after decade after decade. And it is ironic, Isla, it, actually his confirmation was not completely smooth. He had a lot yeah. of folks mad at him as well. And now he's only interim. And he did, in fact, uh, hire Joby back uh, to work on the staff, said she's the most qualified person for the job. But that dissatisfaction with DHHL has been longstanding, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. And I don't know whether it's real leadership or whether it's just the community is of disparate minds about how, what they want DHL, DHHL to do. I think, you know, getting people on the lands, but helping them get the loans, get the buildings, all of that, it it's really needs to be a package. And I'm thinking that um, that may be something that some, you know, we do things a lot, housing package. you know, we do things a lot with working groups and task forces, but I'm thinking that this may be a real issue that could, you know, get some outside mediation, get some stakeholders in and see if they can't come up with a plan that's more suited to the beneficiaries and uh, let them make those decisions. Okay, another um, question on a, what was identified as a major issue at the beginning and then it seemed to sort of percolate out. Uh, three people were killed and two seriously injured in a February 28th by a drunk driver in the Kakaako crash. What drunk driving laws were passed this year? Um, Bob? Well, there was one that toughened the standards for DUIs. Uh, that particular accident was tragic. The guy was drunk out of his mind down in Kakaako, hit people at a, a stoplight. Uh, it wasn't even close to being in the lane, just careening all over the place. Sometimes you just can't fix stupid, right? I mean, you just can't fix it. And no matter what law we had, the guy was already in the tank. He was already way so drunk, he didn't know where he was. So he was going to break the law anyway, right? It didn't matter whether it's one year or five years. He didn't care. Well, they say that, uh, that, that responding to one instant is not a good way of making right. good law, but we also do have a very high rate right now of fatalities uh, due to motor vehicles and pedestrians and so what? on. What about that? Were there other things done in the session to make people safer. Well, Go ahead, Bob. Well, I think there's a cultural change, and you're certainly old enough to remember it. That Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you probably tell your son, just like I tell my sons, don't drink and drive. And if you get stopped drinking and driving, don't call me, because I've already told you don't drink and drive. And I don't, I care if you kill yourself, but what we really care about is you're going to kill other people. And, and, and that message, I think, certainly has gotten through to folks. Um, and it's up to parents and community members to reinforce that. The, the laws, you know, they're important, but as a community, we got to tell people don't drink and drive. It's not acceptable. And by the way, it's not just alcohol. There was a bill from Representative Chris Lee, which ultimately did not make it, but would have added intoxicants mm -hmm. to the list along with alcohol and NyQuil. I, <laughs> and I, there, but for the grace of whoever go I, there are many other things that you could take that could affect your driving. Ultimately, the bill didn't make it. How do you measure taking too much NyQuil? How does a cop, you know, there's a breathalyzer, but how do you measure that for other drugs? And so that it didn't die, but it was, I think, recognition on the part of the legislature that we do need to have public safety paramount and streets. And it was unfortunate what happened. It was very sad. Was it Alamoana Boulevard? Where that actually happened? Yeah, by the convention center. Right. Um, so, but I mean, I, I haven't heard anything, maybe one of you folks can pitch in. I, mean, I haven't heard of anything that was done about the high rates of pedestrian fatalities or I mean, did they, what was there, something? Red light there? cameras, yes. right? Red light cameras, uh, uh, Senator uh, Rhodes had some issues and we were looking at how to, you know, do some traffic calming, some other ways to mark the streets. 
Uh, no, and so there no, were there, no starting the cross up right, once right. the timer starts. And so you can get a a, a ticket for that. So I, I think we're, you know, maybe it's just around the edges, but I think we were trying to come up with how can we make our laws uh, more enforceable and get people to understand that you really have to look both ways. You've got to be responsible, be accountable when you're walking across that street because there are times when a, pedest or a motorist is going to be distracted mm -hmm. and you're going to be the victim if you're not being careful. Remember, there are laws about not using cell phones yes. when you're driving yes. cars. So. What, 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 how is this red light camera thing supposed to work? What's going to happen? You know, we, we did this some time ago, and it was van cams, I think <laughs> is what we called oh, them then, right. and that didn't work. Go ahead, Doug. I'm Mr. Van Cam. <laughs> I, I'm the guy who sold the legislature in that old van cam law, and I, I, I helped write it. And I remember what happened to it, too. So what, how that you law was it? all traffic laws. It wasn't just van cam. Yeah. It allowed camera enforcement and mail traffic citations for all vi violations, moving violations. Well, that was the base law, but then the execution the of execution it made people so else. mad that. Yeah. Well, I mean, but, I mean, do you see us? I mean, so now that spooked the legislature, right? Senator Baker, uh, it made it so anything about electronic traffic enforcement is like the third rail all of a sudden in the Hawaii legislature because of the, the van cam fiasco. Um, do you think that perhaps slowly there'll be an um, um, embracing of electronic and high tech means for traffic enforcement? I certainly hope so because I think we need to be able to use all of the tools at our disposal. And if that's one of the tools that's going to help make our roads safer, make it better for pedestrians. Here we are in a state that is promoting walking and biking, and yet we don't really have as good a grasp, I think, as we could have on how to make sure that motorists follow the rules. Okay. Water bill. Yeah. So this was an issue that was kind of a sleeper, I think, but then it, it kind of blew up with... Uh, a lot of accusations going back and forth. I know Senator from Maui, uh, you know, it was, uh, there was a lot of agitation on Maui in both directions. Um, what played out there, and do you think we're okay without having those extension for all those permits? What, what, what do you think is going to happen next? Well, DLNR says that they can get through them, provided they're not contested cases. But that could have been the case even if the measure had passed. So I Can you think explain a little bit more about the, the current situation and, and what we face because I know that a lot of people were saying, "Oh, this is going to cut off my water by the end of the year." Well, that was what some were saying towards the end. But to be very honest, Maui County gets some of its water from the ditches, mm -hmm. uh, from EMI, and they never came in and said, "You know, we don't think we're going to be able to do this any longer. We're worried." There was a lot of hype, but. I never could see anything other than um, concern that we it was a it was a state resource and we need to have a state solution and we needed to have DLNR involved in that. Was there a feeling that uh, DLNR had basically dropped the ball on this one, had been given enough time, and should be able to figure this out? And now now they really do have to figure it out. Um, that is one school of thought. <laughs> you don't share it. I'm just saying that's one school of thought. <laughs> okay. You guys? I, well, I heard senators say directly that DLNR dropped the ball. I heard Kurt Favela say that. We've got to take over. It is a very complicated issue. Remember, this started with a court case in 2015, yes. a ruling by January 2016. And Alexander and Baldwin had four permits, revocable permits, issued by DLNR. And the circuit judge found that they, had, they were in violation and could no longer uh, have that recourse. So what is A and B going to do? it has to go to the legislature to ask for an extension. That extension, three years, runs out at the end of this year. The problem is, is that while that case is continuing on appeal, there are two utility companies and several small farming and ranching operations, particularly on Kauai and on the Big Island, that are impacted by this, and they're worried. I do think the DLNR is moving ahead on this. Governor Ige has said we are going to give them the resources they needed. But should you then give them another seven years, as the bill called for, and that bill, probably more than just about any other, really divided the legislature, particularly the state senate. Let me yeah, move on to another topic, uh, voter reform. We had the, we had the recount um, that uh, never happened. In, uh, well, the, the, wait, did we have a recount? No, we had a re-vote. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
Oh, what do we do? Very we made everybody Jeremy. vote again. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but there was call for automatic recount after the Waters Ozawa um, race was so close. Um, and that bill passed. That th so they did get an automatic recount. They did. Yes. Did they pass the constitutional amendment and the in the? Statute I believe board. it was just the, the statute just the one, statute. not the Constitution. Okay. And I forget what the margin is for the recount, but it's pretty tight, and it would trigger an automatic recount. Remember, there was also a close race with Senator Favela and Matt Lepresti as well, although the high court didn't take that Isn't a constitutional look. amendment required in order to change the law? I think it can be done statutorily, yes. but there was a separate measure uh, that was a constitutional amendment question. Did we do anything, let me just ask Doug Butler, do you, did you guys folks make progress in your agenda to increase public engagement, uh, voter participation, and so on? We got voting by mail. We did not get, but we came close to getting voter education as part of that bill or as a, as right. a separate initiative. I think that will, that will emerge again next session and has a good chance. Voter education being a more um, media explanation of the things you're Explanation of ballot measures, yes. um, description of candidates by them, you know, self-description self by candidates, pictures of candidates. In other words, give the public a chance to see who's running, what they say, what they say they're going to do, and sort of an equal playing field as opposed to just the people who have the money get to buy the time and people's attention. More of a voter guide. A voter guide. They do it for neighborhood boards in Oahu. There's no reason it can't be done for every, every, everything. Um, but we almost right. got automatic registration of people who, when they sign up for the driver's license, um, that one really is having a really tough sledding, and I'm not sure why at the legislature. Uh, even deep red states have passed that particular measure, so I'm not sure why it doesn't pass in Hawaii. Speaking of red, uh, Republican uh, <laughs> Bob McDermott, where was your, what was your folks' position on some of these election reforms? Do you think that voting by mail is going to help or hurt the Republican Party, for example? Nothing can hurt at this point. So I think <laughs> anything is going to help. Uh, I got to take issue with Doug. He said uh, we want candidates' pictures in there. I'm not sure if that would help me or not. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, but any, anything at this point, and of course it increases participation, right? I, kn I know some Republicans don't like it, but I think it increases participation, and if you've got a good story to tell, what are you fearing, right? Okay, another, um, another issue brought up by a caller. Caller is frustrated that stronger legislation and funding for the fireworks ban has not been enforced. How much longer do we have to gasp for air before leaders take action? Your it, district it, is oh, particularly... ground zero. <laughs> and this is what Doug talked about. He, this is he talked about laws that people don't pay attention to. Well, we got rid of firecrackers and made it uh, just so cumbersome that nobody can get them and nobody's going to use them. Everybody went to illegal aerials. And Eva Beach is ground zero. You don't have to go to Alamone. You just step out your front door and you just look up in the sky. It's uh, quite spectacular on New Year's and uh, Chris, uh, New Year's Eve and Fourth of July. Right. And I'm sitting there with my family. I look at them and I said, somebody ought to do something about this. <laughs> <laughs> and they held up a mirror? Is that what they did? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, go on. I mean, fireworks are a problem on Maui as well, right? Yes. So, I mean, what's happening with that? It seems like it's just like everybody says, well, let's just all break the law for a few hours every year. My recollection is there was a fireworks bill that did pass. I'm not 100% certain, but I was reading some of the re recaps and I thought we passed a bill that provided uh, some liability for homeowners who were oh, allowing oh. that to happen. Wasn't there something that said that you could be a picture. you could be prosecuted by a picture that your neighbor takes oh, or someone yeah. takes? Okay. If it's if it's on your property. But most of them are set off in the street, so I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that, that may not <laughs> work. Well, it's, well, it's good. But, but you know, I would say that while aerials are still a serious problem and not just in have a beach, it has gotten better. There have been crackdowns, as you mentioned, on firecrackers. I, I mean, I can remember many a New Year's Eve where it looked like a war zone. It was so smoky, and I think there has been improvement. I know Senator Willis Sparrow was pushing mm -hmm. to have inspection of shipping containers right. to try and crack down on those aerials coming over, but it's very hard to do. And there's also the cultural component, people that recognize that that's valuable, and not just on the 4th of July, but mm -hmm. Chinese New Year yeah, and so right. forth. They're, they're well, every Friday night off of uh, Waikiki, Waikiki, right? Hilton Hawaiian Village. Yeah. There's no more firecrackers. It's all aerials now, right? So what Chad was talking about, the world, the war zone is gone. Right. But that's because we made it so cumbersome for people to get them. So they switched to the aerials, which I think are worse because yeah. they can land on people's roofs and start fires, right? Okay, another one. Um, we didn't hear much about schools this year. 
I mean, was there anything significant? I think at one point there was a proposal to have uh, county school districts. Uh, we were there was going to be talk about uh, renewing the idea of redeveloping school lands, uh, you know, for housing and so on. I know that Senator uh, Chang was often talking about redeveloping McKinley High School into a multiple high-rise, you know, area. What happened with the schools issues? Do, do you recall? Well, I had one major school issue and. Rep McDermott and I have uh, uh, jousted oh, you, you over. You guys both have hugely crowded yes, schools. Yes, yes, and yeah. uh, finally we're moving forward with a new high school in Kihei, so that was really my school focus this year. Uh, but of course, all of our schools need uh, various uh, repairs and maintenance, and I'm happy to say that many of the schools in uh, Maui County receive some relief as a result. Was it, was, it, was, it, was it a priority in the budget process to, to get enough money to repair schools? It's always a priority. But you, whether, we're, yeah. whether we're trying to, to, to cool the schools or repair, you know, we're, we want to make sure that Title IX is upheld so that you have uh, equal facilities for uh, women or girls playing sports as you do for the, the boys. And we got some of that in the budget this year. There's money for uh, new preschool classrooms as well, and that was significant. Yes. Remember the Governor Ige made universal statewide preschool his goal when he spoke in his state of the state. The thing that we tend to forget because issues come and they die, but there was actually a push to increase the general excise tax to, to help schools, to get teachers, help retain them, help with facilities. This, of course, arose out of the, the constitutional amendment question that it failed, failed right. uh, last session. And so this was the HSTA trying once again, but that was killed pretty early on. And, and then we didn't spend as much time. But remember also that the Department of Education really gets a huge chunk of the state budget. Yes. It's at least 1.8 billion, sometimes as high as 2 billion. I think it may still be the greatest expenditure for any agency, pretty darn close. You so, know, let me ask you, Bob McDermott, with, with your district having you know, so many very crowded schools, so much growth, do you feel like there's a, a sincere effort to try and keep up or are they, for the most part, does the legislature willing to just let those schools grow and, and then in their own districts not close down a school that might be too small? Well, first I want to give a shout out to the governor for his uh, school, Cool Schools initiative. Uh, thanks to him, Campbell High School is fully air conditioned now, 100%. So, you know, it was miserable there for years. So you got 3,000 cool kids. Yeah, you got, well, actually 3,200 plus. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody, uh, Roz and I both love the kids. We all love the kids, so we just have to fight over this finite pie, right? Yeah. And so uh, it's how, how do you do that? And is the timing right? And all those other things. So I think the legislature loves kids. It's just you have 75 people down there fighting for a slice of the pie. And who gets it this time and who gets it next time? Does that make it so it's not going to be, you're not, never going to be able to keep up with these high growth areas? No, no, you will because the DOE sets a priority list and you can't ignore that, right? You can ignore it for like a year or maybe two, but Campbell was number one on the priority list for a new building. And it, it took two years, but we finally got it because the reality is you got to put the kids somewhere. But does it make a difference? Like if you're a legislator who's a, you've been there for 10 years? So, uh, Wait a minute, but a, a Republican broke legislator from, from Eva Beach versus Senator Baker, you know, with all due respect, you're one of the more powerful senators in, 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 in this place. Do you, are you able to get what you want more than someone like Bob McDermott can get yes. what he wants? <laughs> <laughs> no question about that. <laughs> we have to junk and post sometimes. <laughs> you're not going to go there? No. no. Okay. <laughs> Chad, what do you think? Do you think that the politics gets in the way of school funding? Yes, Senator Baker is more powerful. Than <laughs> Senator McDermott, that's clear. Um, I think, I, I think, I think McDermott, Rep. McDermott is being sincere. I think everybody in that building, all 76 lawmakers, care a great deal. But there's no question that politics does play an issue here. The governor himself, some have accused him of directly getting involved with the DOE's business, and picking a superintendent, and so forth. And I won't go down that route. But one can't help but think about that. It, but I think the fact that Campbell got the AC, I mean, we used to go there with uh, heat detectors and measure exactly how, you know, how the body imaging, you can see how hot it is. 
and you needed that kind of attention. And you had Campbell High School uh, bring schools to the rotunda and to protest. Corey Rosenlee did that. Corey Rosenlee, HSDA. Yeah. And the fact that a Republican district like Bob's uh, has that today, I think, shows that ultimately they do care. Just one thing. Uh, so Roz has a way to get things done. And then we have, you know, when I have to uh, file lawsuits, yell and scream, draw attention to the matter, be a real pain in the butt, and I say, can't you know? And, and can't you just shut him up, give him something, right? <laughs> so that's a two different approaches. The squeaky wheel approach. Yeah. Okay. Um, this is a core quality of life issue. You know, two two callers. People keep moving to the mainland because of Hawaii's high cost of living. What can you do to improve the quality of life in Hawaii? Keep people from leaving. Number two, caller is frustrated about high cost of living. This is literally two different callers. Um, and his children and grandchildren are leaving the state to find a living wage. When is the legislature going to make some changes to help Hawaii's families stay together? I think this is indirectly a question about affordable housing. And was, was there a significant progress toward building a, a larger stock of affordable housing? Well, we started uh, with the homeless, trying to make sure that we added um, significant resources, not only to the base budget, but to some other initiative to try to make sure that uh, people had housing. Um, you know, we're out in the middle of the Pacific. I don't know whether we're ever going to be able to be as cost effective as Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia, and I wouldn't want to live there. I grew up in Texas, and it's, you know, pretty expensive in some of the big cities there as well. So I think what we have to do is look at how we can all work together to make sure that everybody has that living wage and that legislature, the state funds what it can. We pull down federal grants to the extent we can. We engage the private sector to help in some of these areas. But it's, it really is about everybody pulling together and trying to figure out what it is that we want to do and how we can do it best. Let me get back to the, the core of the question was about quality of life. I reinterpret it to be about affordable housing, but I think affordable housing is a big question. Any of you folks have a perspective I, I, on did, was there progress made? Was yes. It easier was, to build affordable we've housing? We passed a slew of yeah. bills to enable people to build affordable housing. Uh, in targeted areas near the rail line, I'm thinking Oahu centric, of course, or near the rail line, uh, state lands being able to be leased for housing, low income housing. I think Roz hit it on the head when you say what's affordable. We're not, like she said, Arkansas. And people want to live here, more people want to live here uh, than we can sustain or support. So, what the market keeps them out through the, the increase in, in housing. And real estate, by, by the way, if you look at the actuarial charts, increases 100% every 10 years. So the house I bought for 212,000 is now worth 600. And I've owned it maybe 16 years, right? So that that keeps people out of the market. If once they get in, they can ride that up and build equity. And that, I think, along the rail line, at least for here, if we can get s some affordable apartments, condominiums for young people to buy them, and then they can earn equity as the market rises. And then in 10 years, they can buy their own home. Chad, what happened with the proposals to have state leasehold land projects? Well, the one that the like governor that. proposed, a 99-year lease, there was some discussion in some other bills, but that bill of the governor's didn't actually make it. it it'll still, it will be built around the rail stations. Of course, there is a question yeah, as to whether, uh, whether the rail line will actually come through. Uh, he'll be back again next session. There seems to be a discussion. I talked with Stanley Chang, the state senator, and he had a pretty ambitious bill, Aloha Housing Program. Right based on the Singapore model and, and how that nation state uh, provides affordable housing. But he says the reality is we're putting more units online. I think he said about 2,000 a year, but you need 6,000 yeah. a year. And there's a real challenge there. But um, it will remain top of mind, and it'll be back next session. Doug Deller from, uh, Meller from uh, League of Women Voters. Did you get a sense that the overall quality of life was an issue for this legislature? Do you feel like what, from what you saw, life's going to get better here? because of their work? There were a lot of bills which didn't pass, so people are concerned, but I don't think they agree what's supposed to be done with it. Okay, um, last one. The caller wants to know what happened with the $200 million funding earmarked for affordable housing. I mean, it's hard to figure out when what got done on some of these issues. Well, we have a number of proposals that are going to be coming online. One of them in, in my district uh, near the villages of Leali'i, and it's, you know, affordable rentals. It's 400 units, but it's 400 units they can get up. There's uh, another 
uh, subdivision that's going to be coming online. Uh, the houses are almost ready to be moved in. So there, we're making some progress, but I think the, the problem is um, people like to come here. We want our children to stay here and it's expensive and we've got to figure out how we can create more supply and make sure that the local residents have a shot at that housing. There, were, there was enabling legislation passed, uh, particularly uh, what I saw around the rail line, you know, mm -hmm. to encourage, if you go down to the poo-poos, right, in 10 this years. part of Waipahu that's yeah. alongside the rail, yeah. And, and waterfront property, in 10 years it's all gonna be raised. Those are three-story walk-ups, they're, they're for low-income folks. That's valuable real estate. You could build towers there and house many more folks. Well, Paul was in for bigger changes than anybody can expect. Yeah. So we are now out of time. Thank You're you kidding. all very much. Yeah. Wow. Fast. It's a friendly group. <laughs> <laughs> Mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight. And we thank our guests, Maui Senator Rosalind Baker, Chair of the Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee, Douglas Meller from the League of Hawaiian Voters, League of League of Women Voters, Representative Bob McDermott, House Assistant Minority Leader, representing Eva and Eva Beach, and Chad Blair, Honolulu Civil Beat political and opinion editor next week on Insights. Should people rescued from areas that are dangerous and off limits to the public be charged for the cost of that rescue? Please join us for what will certainly be a lively discussion. I'm Daryl Huff for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Ahui ho. <laughs>